You heard from Dr. Beaver yesterday. What happened to Ms. Josephson, to say it was a horrific experience, a vicious attack, is an understatement. Over 100 wounds is a lot of wounds. But I can't, can't get around how even Dr. Bieber is convinced that he was, I guess the first time seeing this in court, he just knew automatically it was the weapon. Um, he, just, he explained the single, you know, not the, the double wounds, the single wounds, as somebody using this tool in this manner to create the this, this single blade. Y'all remember that? Now how, in the back seat of a car, in the dark, with a young woman who is fighting for her life, somebody is supposed to hold this, this tool with a blade literally pointed in their direction and not injure themselves in some way, how somebody does that is beyond me. It's, it's this long when it's together. Y'all look. Let's try it again. Look at it. Wildly swinging, wildly stabbing, and whatever rage is going on, and there's not a cut on it? How do you accomplish that? With this, Black said, "You know, he readily just identified it. He was really excited. He wanted to let y'all know he had identified the murder weapon after seeing it for ten seconds while sitting on the stand." The cause of death in this case was never a question. Never. Nobody ever said that Miss Josephson was not stabbed and died because of those injuries. I don't know what Dr. Bieber's intentions were. I don't know why he tried to explain to y'all that Ms. Josephson's fingernails were too short to get DNA under them after we already had testimony that they collected DNA out from under them. I don't know what that show was about. But this young lady had over 100 stab wounds. There is evidence on her body. There's bruises. She has discoloration of her knuckles. Either she hit something or something hit her. Her fingernails were ripped, even though some witnesses don't want to admit that they were after the fact. We know from SLED that they were ripped. We know from SLED that they were of medium length. Not the, not the short nails that Ms. Gooch showed y'all yesterday, though she barely has nails. His report said medium length and they were ripped. That's what we know. She put up a fight, and the thing Roland had not a mark on him. That is what we know. There's a footprint in the window. Her fingernails are ripped. She's got bruises. She's got defensive wounds. She didn't lay there. She didn't give up. We never suggested that she did. They've never suggested that she did. This young woman fought. And Mr. Goldberg said that she left a trail with her footprint. Well, she gave y'all the conclusion with her nails. She told y'all who it was. Now, I've touched on a, a few of the, you know, a few of the things that, I guess, just were overlooked at being introduced to you. You know, photographs of Nathaniel that were taken by Agent uh, Jazik that showed absolutely no injuries. They didn't even ask him about it. Ask her about it. They didn't even ask her. They said, did you respond to headquarters? Yes, I responded to headquarters. And what did you do? Well, I took some photographs. And did you collect the clothes? Yes, I collected the clothes. They didn't even ask her. Just wanted to brush on by it like it didn't matter. 
She told you in great detail, Ms. Good asked her in great detail, you took pictures of the back of the hands? Yes. Front of the hands? Yes. Both sides of the arms? Yes. His face, his neck, and there wasn't a mark on his body. If there had been, y'all would be looking at those pictures. If Ms. Josephson had Nathaniel Rowland's DNA under his fingernails, do y'all think they would have left that out? How many times do you think they would have had the DNA analyst on the stand confirming that his DNA is under her fingernails? How many times? But because it's not there, they don't want to talk about it. They want to tell you it doesn't matter because it doesn't work for them. <coughs> Some of the videos that y'all are going to be able to watch, I do ask you to watch them. Please watch them. I don't, I, y'all are going to be able to take the, the big TV back there, but you'll have some device in your jury room to watch these videos. The PDF that was, you know, the, pre, the um, PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Martin showed y'all yesterday, you know, that was our first time seeing it too. We, we don't have a Justin Martin in our office, so, you know, we were just sitting there watching 25 plus hours worth of video, doing the same thing, staring at these videos, trying to identify cars, where they were going, you know, how can we try to get some sort of timing on what was going on, do we see the driver of the vehicle? That one video y'all have, the wrong turn down Saluda, Mr. Goldberg showed it to you today, you know, a short clip. You'll be able to watch it. And if you remember, when Mr. Sheely was on the stand, I asked him, he's the owner of Statewide Security, where they got all these videos from. I asked him to confirm whether or not he had a second camera on Saluda. And he does. So we're all familiar with five points. Uh, I assume we're all familiar with five points. If you are at Gourmet Shop or at the Fountain or at Starbucks, that intersection heading into Shandon is Saluda Avenue. You can see the vehicle turn left, going the wrong way, and travel down in front of Gourmet Shop. Right before you get to Gourmet Shop, right where that car turned, there is a camera that is literally pointed into the driver's side of a car. It is directly in the street. It's got Three or four different angles on it, but one of them. Yes, sir. Basis for the objection. So, argument about facts not in evidence. Okay. I do want to All right. He told you there is another camera there. And the only reason you don't have that footage is because law enforcement never asked for it. They never asked for it. They bring you all this other stuff, but they never ask for it. And unfortunately, we were not given the opportunity to ask the investigators in this case why they didn't ask for it. Did y'all notice that none of them testified? None of the lead investigators in this case testified. They've been sitting here all week. This end, that end, and then Agent uh, Investigator Owens is sitting right behind them. None of them testified. So we couldn't ask questions. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you look into this? Did you follow up on something? Did you follow up when you got the DNA reports? Did you follow up on anything? Because they didn't put them on the stand. I cannot tell you why, but I can tell you they've been here all week and y'all have not heard from them. We couldn't ask them any questions. Now the state has the burden, you, you'll hear from the judge and you heard from Mr. Goldberg, the burden of proof. The burden of proof is not a small thing. It is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Everybody has a different definition on what that means. Everybody explains that 
differently when they're talking about it. What it boils down to is hesitation. A hesitation to act. And the hesitation doesn't have to be long. The hesitation can be a split second. That's reasonable doubt. If you think for half a second, that's hesitation. If before you put your pen to the paper, you pause, that's hesitation. That's what beyond a reasonable doubt is. That's how you make this decision. And y'all hold them to their burden. Hold them to it. Making poor choices, not, not calling law enforcement, riding around in a car you know that you should not be driving around in, does not mean that you are guilty of murder. It does not mean that you are guilty of kidnapping. If that's the case, then Maria Howard should have been charged too, because y'all, she drove the car twice with her baby in it. Just because you do things that seem completely irrational, because they are, they are it's completely irrational to drive around in a car with blood in it, does not mean that you are guilty of murder. They have to prove that Nathaniel Rowland killed Samantha Josephson. Nothing on this table and nothing from that box proves that. They have to prove that he kidnapped Samantha Josephson. Again, nothing on this table and nothing from that stand proves that. They've created a narrative and he's the villain in their narrative because for them he is the easy answer. He is the simple answer. In this case, it's the wrong answer. It is the wrong answer. The state said that they, you know, they understand their burden, they welcome their burden. They don't have a choice. They have to meet their burden if y'all are going to vote to convict. They have to, they cannot reject it. It is their burden, y'all hold them to it. March 29th, 2019, the unthinkable did happen. Samantha Josephson's life was cut short in the most violent way. Nobody is going, nobody has stood up here and told y'all that she deserved what happened or tried to blame her in any way. Anyway, what happened to her is tragic. It is heartbreaking. And this is an emotional case. It is an emotionally charged case. I know it. The state knows it. Everybody in here knows that. But as jurors, I used to believe I could ask juries to put your emotions aside, leave them at the door. Y'all are human beings. Me asking that of you, it goes completely against human nature. You can't check your emotions. That's part of who we are. What I can ask of you is to not let your emotions dictate your decision. Don't let your emotions, the fact that this is a sad, tragic, heartbreaking case, dictate your decision when you go deliberate. That's what I can ask of you. The state has not proven that Nathaniel Rowland kidnapped Samantha Josephson. They have not proven that he has killed her, and they have not proven that he had a weapon during those crimes. What they proved is that he tried to sell her cell phone. He's not on trial for that. What they proved is that he did not call law enforcement when he should have. He's not on trial for that. They have failed at meeting their burden. I ask that you find him not guilty. Thank you.